Hi, I'm Chris Mutchler, VCDX257 from virtualelephant.com. And in this video, we're going to talk about a skill that every enterprise architect should have, being able to develop a future state architecture. Let's get started. As an enterprise architect, you'll probably be tasked with creating a future state architecture, either for your organization or for a customer that you work with. But what exactly is a future state architecture? And that's a great question that I want to start off with right now. So a future state architecture is more than just a roadmap. It's actually a visionary projection of where an organization aims to go in the future. And it should encompass not just technology, but also processes, information systems, and the very way that teams collaborate and function. In this ever-changing technology landscape, as an enterprise architect, our role is not just to adapt, but to be a step ahead of where our organizations and our customers want to go. Being able to craft a future state architecture isn't going to just be a task for you. It should be an essential skill set. It's about understanding the pulse of the market, predicting technological advancements, and aligning them with the strategic goals of your organization. In this video, I'm going to walk you through how to master a future state architecture using a workshop template that I've used in the past with customers myself. Now, everyone is going to approach this differently. And what I want you to get out of this video is a way for you to start having conversations with your organizations, your stakeholders, or your customers on how you can develop a future state architecture for them that they can work through as you try to predict where the market is going and what's going to be critical for your organizations over the next 12, 18, or 24 months. For my future state architecture workshops, I break it down into three sections. First, the architecture lifecycle framework, which I've discussed in a video previously and that I'll link above. In this framework discussion, I go over the four key areas, the architecture vision, the implementation, the operationalization, as well as the maturity assessment, and why each phase is important to the organizations from an architecture lifecycle perspective, and are going to be critical aspects of our future state architecture workshop. Once I've gone over the four key areas, one of the things that I dive into are the different types of architecture artifacts that we're going to be generating as part of this future state architecture. The first thing that we're going to do, which should be no surprise to anyone, is we're going to spend time gathering the requirements, understanding the assumptions that were made with the existing architecture, understanding the risks that exist within the environments, both from a technical perspective and a business perspective. And then we're going to walk through and create a new conceptual design, a new logical design, and finally getting into the physical design and all of the design decisions that we've made. Now, certain aspects of this might be handed off to others, like a solutions architect supporting your uh, account or your customer or your organization, specifically around the physical design. That might not be something that you get to within the initial workshop that we're going to be performing. Once we go through that, we're going to review what a functional and a non-functional requirement is. Now, requirements gathering might be new to the organization, and applying an enterprise architecture framework like TOGAF might be entirely new. So it's going to be on you as the enterprise architect to explain what the difference is between functional and non-functional requirements. Once we've gone through and level set there, we're going to level set on what the different design characteristics are. Now, these are going to vary based on the needs and the business use cases or the strategic direction that a customer is taking their architecture or their business needs. But we're going to play with these six design characteristics, explain to the customer what they are, how they're relevant, and how they interact with one another so that we can then go through and actually stack rank them when we're doing the workshop itself to understand what decisions and what characteristics are going to drive the design decisions that we're going to be making. And then from there, we're going to review what a design decision is. Again, this might be entirely new to your stakeholders, organization, or customer. So we're going to walk them through and help them to understand what the different decisions are, the implications, risk identification, the requirements that we addressed, 
and all of those things around a design decision, which should really be a bread and butter skill for you as an enterprise architect. And then once that's done, we're going to review with them what a good design decision template should look like. And again, I have a video where I've dived into this and provided an example, which again, I'll link above. Now, once we've gone through and we've understood kind of the framework that we're going to be placing around this future state architecture and level setting with the stakeholders, that's, this is where we're really going to dive into what the current state architecture is that the customer has. Now, one of the first things that the TOGAF framework puts in place is being able to do a baseline assessment of the current state architecture. And that's going to inform include five key aspects that we're going to want to dive into as part of this future state architecture workshop. So the first thing that we want to be able to do is understand what were the business objectives initially for the current state architecture? What were the strategic priorities at the time? And how have those been met or satisfied or not at this point? The second thing that we want to talk about is the artifact repository. Where is the customer, stakeholder, or organization currently keeping all of the artifacts that define what our current state architecture is? Now, the reason that we want to understand where this is is so that we as enterprise architects, especially if we're coming in as a consultant or just new to the organization, we want to understand where these artifacts are kept so that we can go through and review them as we're working through the future state architecture so that we can familiarize ourselves with what they've already done. And this is going to be critical as well because any documentation or artifacts that we create for this future state architecture should then be kept in the repository going forward. Now, once we understand where that is, that's really where the architecture review is going to come into play. Now, how much time we spend within this architecture review phase will really depend on the complexity of the environment. And then we're going to move on to the data collection and analysis. Now, this is going to vary from organization to organization based off of the operational tools that they're leveraging. Maybe they have different tools for capacity planning, tools like Densify or vRealize Operations. Maybe they're a client of Dell and they have live optics data. Or maybe they're a customer of VMware or Broadcom now, and they are actually have access to the TAM data. But we're going to want to gather all of those metrics so that we can understand what their current state looks like and what good looks like to the customer at this point. And then once we have all of that data, the last thing that we're going to do is actually create a gap analysis. We want to understand where the current state architecture is maybe missing based off of what the original business or strategic use cases were for the environments, as well as understanding where they're trying to go next. What are we developing? What are we architecting for in the future? Another critical aspect as we're going through this baseline evaluation of the current state architecture is understanding what key performance indicators the customer, stakeholder, or organization already has in place. Now, this can really be focused around six different areas. The first area being one of the most common ones, and that's going to be system performance. What are our response times? What are our error rates? What's our SLO, our MTBF, our MTBR, so on and so forth? as well as then cost metrics. What is our total cost of ownership? Are we meeting the needs of the business from a cost perspective? How much does it cost to maintain the environment? How much time is being spent based off of the environment to be able to realize a lower cost based off of what our objectives were at the time? Once we understand the cost metrics, then we wanna understand the scalability metrics. These are metrics around time to onboard new environments or new workloads, time to deploy, time to stand up the physical infrastructure, the time spent lifecycling the environment, or the frequency that which we are able to actually perform lifecycle activities. Once we've moved on from the scalability metrics, we want to focus on the security metrics. And this is more and more important as we think about the security incidents that we've seen recently publicized around the casinos and other environments in the United States and globally. So we want to understand what are our incident rates? What are the results of our audits that we're performing? How frequently are we having incidents? How quickly are we able to patch those, those vulnerabilities that are out in the wild, as well as the frequency? Are we able to complete those patching operations within the time frame that our CISO has perhaps set from a guidelines perspective? Once we understand the security metrics, then we're going to move on to business alignment. 
Now, these are going to be things around, are we adhering to our ITIL processes? Do we have specific use case metrics that we're watching for our applications that we're deploying and operating within this architecture? And what are our strategic objective metrics? These are things that perhaps our CIO or CTO are being graded on quarterly. And then finally, if the organization is very mature, they might also have user satisfaction survey data that we want to leverage as we look at their current state to be able to understand where their users think that there are gaps or holes within the architecture offering. Now, once we've gone through the current state architecture and we've gathered all of the information, metrics, logical diagrams, physical diagrams that the customer or stakeholders might have, we're going to actually move into the design workshop itself. Now, I don't wanna leave you with the impression that you're going to accomplish all of these tasks in a single day. This might be something that you break up over the course of a week or many weeks, depending on how much information the customer has to go out and gather with your assistance to be able to address what the current state is and what you're going to be moving to from a future state architecture perspective. The first thing that you're going to want to do is actually review the design characteristics and go through and stack rank them based off of what the new business priorities are or what the new priorities for this future state architecture will be. Now, once you understand the stack ranking of these characteristics, you're going to want to move into the actual requirements gathering phase. Now, hopefully you understand what the requirements were when they created the existing or the current state architecture, and you can really focus in here on which requirements have changed or what new requirements they may have. And then again, as part of this portion, you're going to want to also cover the constraints and the assumptions as well. Now, once I've gathered the requirements, the constraints and the assumptions, and perhaps even some of the new risks that we might have identified or risks that the business identified that we're going to address in the new future state architecture, the next portion of the design workshop is the part that I personally love the most, and that's the whiteboarding session. And here, what you're going to want to do is actually start whiteboarding out what the new logical design of that future state architecture is going to look like. And from there, as you're working through the whiteboarding exercise, you can also dive into some of the key design decisions that you're going to make from a future state architecture perspective. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that you're going to capture everything or every design decision as part of this future state architecture workshop. This is really going to be the jumping off point for these efforts. And you're going to take the future state architecture that you create, and then perhaps you're going to hand it off to a solutions architect or maybe even another enterprise architect within the organization to then go through and actually determine and create the entire architecture that the customer might leverage going forward. But again, this future state architecture should really be a logical design that you've come up with that's going to address the most critical requirements that the business has going forward. Again, I like to look at future state architectures as things that are 12, 18, and 24 months out that we're going to try and accomplish either within my own organization or for a customer's organization. Now, once you've gone through the design workshop portion of this, the final phase is really around the future state architecture itself. And here, the first thing that I like to do is actually have a conversation around what the future state possibilities are that exist. Is this an opportunity for multi-cloud? Is this an opportunity to expand our existing data center footprint? Is it a hybrid cloud between the two where you're going to be leveraging some public assets as well as some private assets, and being able to spend time with the customer to help them understand the vision that's possible as we work towards this future state architecture. From there, we're going to go ahead and dive into some of the different deployment options that exist. Now, if this is a Broadcom customer or a former VMware customer, I'll likely spend a lot of time talking about VMware Cloud Foundation. If you're an enterprise architect where your organization is mostly leveraging public cloud assets, you might now have a discussion around the benefits of leveraging additional AWS resources or additional Azure resources or additional GCP resources. This is really where you have the flexibility to understand and develop a future state architecture that's going to be able to encompass 
the totality of the business objectives that they've set for you. And regardless of the underlying technologies that you're leveraging here, the importance of this exercise and the importance of the future state architecture is to be able to provide a roadmap to the customer so that they can see out into the future what they're working towards. Now, this might be able to be focused around, you know, adopting additional services, maybe expanding into the cloud native space, or maybe this is just a simplification from an operational standpoint. Maybe there's just a large effort that needs to be spent automating common tasks. Regardless of what it is, the future state architecture should be able to provide that vision and you as the enterprise architect should be able to think big here, be able to think of all of the possibilities that exist for your organization or your customer as you move them towards this future state architecture. I hope you found this video on future state architecture and how I personally go through this exercise with my own customers as an enterprise architect helpful to you as you continue to upskill your careers and move forward on this enterprise architecture career path that we find ourselves on. Now, if you've liked this video, I'll ask you to please subscribe to my channel, Virtual Elephant, on YouTube and hit me up on Twitter at Chris Mutchler. I love making these videos and even more, I love hearing from you on what you think. And if there are topics you'd like to see me cover in the future, please out, reach out to me and let me know. Until next time, thanks.